Okay, guys, welcome back to Holden's 11. I have a terrific guest tonight, and I can't wait to talk to him. Tonight's special guest is novelist Steve Guglich. Thanks for coming, Steve. Oh, thanks. I'm so excited to be here. I've been, this is, it's been awesome watching your show and, and then now to have the chance to be a guest. So this is pretty awesome. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. And I'll tell you, I'm one of the guys I've been watching behind the scenes, the production of your novel. And I'm really excited for it, man. Uh, please expect me to be one of your first backers. And I, I can't <sighs> wait to check this out. Do you have a launch Thank date? You. November 1st. Oh, man, right around the corner. Perfect. Yeah, it's coming up. It's okay, so, so uh, folks watching out there on YouTube land, go ahead and book you bookmark that for uh, November 1st. Without further ado, we're going to launch right into our topic tonight, which is going to be the top 11 fantasy novels. I, I can't wait to talk about this one with you. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be exciting. And of course, I want to encourage people to uh, feel free to disagree with us, right? The the theme of our show is we just kind of celebrate the things that we love, and maybe we can hear about some of the things that in inspired Steve on his journey, and I think it'll be a lot of fun. Awesome. I'm so without further ado, let's launch right in. I got number 11, and he's going to appear on this list twice on account of who he is. It's The Silmarillion by J.R.R. Tolkien. Oh. And are you a Tolkien fan? I am a Tolkien fan, but I, I've actually never read this The Marillion. Uh, I, I enjoyed uh, definitely the Lord of the Rings trilogy, The Hobbit. I loved growing up watching that, reading it. I mean, I, I, I took in Tolkien in every form that I could when I was younger. Yeah, it's something I think a novelist, it seems to be a common thread for them. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, Tolkien's the grandfather of, uh, of fantasy. I mean, or the father. I guess they call him the grandfather of fantasy. So yeah. uh, that's, that's probably or a pretty apt the description. the godfather of fantasy. I don't know. I'm, I'm the same way, too. And I did, for that reason, I wanted to have the Silmarillion on the list. But you notice I kind of put it at the bottom because I will say that uh, – it's not an easy read, right? It's the one that a lot of people don't seem to like very much. Yeah, it's it's definitely written more like a history book from what I understand. Yeah, yeah, very much like a history book. And some people describe it as it's almost got sort of like a biblical element. You know, it starts out with the, the old gods and how they created the world and that kind of thing, awesome. which I guess some of which yeah. has been displayed in this new uh, television show, which is on Amazon currently. The Rings it has of this, Power. Yeah, yes. it's got this terrific production value. I haven't really oh, absorbed it. Too I much have yet. watched it, and I tell you, I am not afraid to admit that I'm a fan. I think it's fabulous. I I'm really enjoying it. Well, I'm glad to hear that because it's something I haven't checked out yet. And well, I don't want to give away too much because it's coming up <laughs> in number ten here. But it's something that I'm going to have to check out because I guess as a self-professed Tolkien fan, I would be doing a disservice if I didn't watch the uh, TV well, show. Well, see, right? that's the thing. If so, you've never read the Silmarillion either, huh? No, I've read it. it oh, you look, have? Yeah, I got to love with you. I'm a super nerdy kind of guy. Um, <laughs> I, I, I rank the Silmarillion really high. But okay. I like sort of like the dry but, and dusty okay, so history stuff. Then you may not like the Rings of Power because uh, that's one of the big controversies with that show is that they they take from the Silmarillion, but they also decide to you know do their things here and there. And uh, so I I think the more diehard Tolkien fans uh, are not enjoying it as much. But I I'm <laughs> that's what I heard. That's what I heard. And I I sort of am leaving that to the side for now because like we say, the theme of the show is to celebrate what we love. And I, <laughs> that's I, right. I specifically try not to kind of rag on things. Uh, you know, there's <laughs> yeah. a lot of well, content on the internet. Like I said, I love it. I mean, I'm I'm totally enjoying it. I am I am uh, I'm a rings of rings of power fan. That's for sure. Well, you know what? On your recommendation, Steve, I will check that out. <laughs> so while we kind of touched on the Amazon.prime uh, thing, let's launch right into number 10, which is uh, Game of Thrones by George R.R. R. Martin. And I'm a fan of George R.R. R. Martin. I know he's somewhat divisive, too, but yeah, I think that he nails his character development. And I think that when you talk about successful fantasy, that's one of the things, right? You have to have these archetypal oh, for characters. For sure, yeah. I mean, you got to you got to be able to you, you got to have the whole package in order to get you know to to do fantasy. You can't you can have a good story, but then you get a bad character development or bad world building, and that that can collapse the whole thing. And I know that uh, Martin does that. He's got the he's able to do all all of that character development, story, world building. It's all there. Yeah. Can I ask you, Steve, when you started your book, did you like do you start with the story first and then populate it with characters or do you start with the characters? Tell us a little bit about your well, writing process. 
I had I had the story idea and I started writing. Um, I'm not I'm what they call a pantser. You know, I just I kind of write by the seat of my pants. I don't do an outline because <laughs> I tried outlining. Everybody's like, you got to outline, you got to yeah. outline. And I started the outline. And when I started the outline, I just started writing anyway. So I'm like, this is a waste of my time. I'm just going to write the stories. And yeah. so I did. And then I got I got sort of stuck there for a little bit. And I was talking to another fellow writer, Carlos Bo, and he was uh, he asked me to critique his um, a passage or, or a chapter from his book. And when I read it, I was blown away. It was just so well written. But the world building really stuck out. I felt like as he was describing the world, I was walking through it. And I, I really commented on that. And he's like, Steve, I tell you, I've been working on this book for years I actually built the entire city out of pizza boxes in my living room in New York City, he said. <laughs> That's so, so awesome. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So that really got me into thinking, okay, so I need to go back and do some deep world building. And and so I I do consider that a, a passion and 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 honestly an expertise. I, I do consider myself a deep world builder. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I can't wait to check it out. I'm a world building guy myself. And uh, I'm really looking forward to your novel, Steve. I, I'm going to day one. I'll be there. You can count on me. I appreciate um, that. We'll move right into our number nine. It's Watership Down by Richard <sighs> Adams. Man. I'm a huge fan of Watership oh, yes. Down. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I remember that as a kid and just the uh, the tragic story of these animals, anthropomorphic uh, animal. It was just oh, such a great story. I mean, uh, and I, you know, I guess it would be considered fantasy, um, but, you know, most people... I don't know. I don't know. Do most people think of Watership Down as a fantasy or just a story you know, about it, animals that I, talk? I think that's a good <laughs> uh, a good argument, Steve. And, you know, we talk about it's difficult to maintain the integrity of these lists. And uh, for our viewers, we kind of chatted about this behind the scenes and we had to kind of filter out some of the ones that were more sci fi because, yeah. you know, for our purposes tonight, I wanted to keep it, you know, things that are more in the wheelhouse of your upcoming novel. And to me, the, the even though it's anthropomorphic animals, you know, Watership Down has kind of this epic feel, right? Oh, and, yeah, definitely, yeah. And, and, you know, the the characters are portrayed almost like they were different races. And mm -hmm. I, I think the scope of the story lends itself to fantasy. And I noticed in my research that it was it seemed to crop up on all the lists. And since For it's sure. one of my I favorites, mean, I wanted to include it. I'm sure that it's, I mean, I, I would classify it as fantasy. But I think if you're just talking about the, you know, to, to a person in general, yeah, I think it I guess that's what I'm trying to say. It kind of transcends that because you can you can be a fan of uh, a fantasy and then you can also be a fan of, a fan of Watership Down and not really like fantasy. But just because yeah, the story point. of Watership yeah. Down is so engaging and tragic. And, and right. I, mean, I remember I just shared it with my kids a few years back and they were like they were, they didn't know what to make of it. Yeah. And it's it's really kind of a. Uh... It has a similar kind of setup, right? Like you have, it's sort of set up like there's these old gods that propel the belief systems of these anthropomorphic animals. Like there's uh, El Arrera and Frith, and they're these, uh, yeah. it, it's almost like a sort of, almost like a Christian type setup that, that propels yeah. the story forward. And uh, to me, I was fascinated by that when I was younger. I just couldn't believe that it was these because I think you go into it thinking it's going to be these cute characters and maybe exactly. even a little bit of humor, but it's this kind of tragic and it, epic storyline. It really line. is. I mean, Quickly, it, it, I mean, you couldn't put it down, right? I mean, it could have easily have been alien races or or, or fantasy races in some some sense. You know, it just I think that's what just made it so unique and different is that they had these great and vast cultures and background, and the world building was just there, but it just just turned out to be animals <laughs> right right hey i'd like to ask you a question about that when you make your characters how do you first off how do you come up with the characters well like i said i'm a, I'm a deep world builder which means that i go back you know if i'm creating a race i want to know everything about them i want to know the why i always start with the why why do they do this why do they have this what's what, what's the the origin of this tradition so i do have a in my series, it takes place here on Earth in the modern world, but it's it, it asks the question is, what happened to the magic? You know, because if you go back in time and look at all this mythology and all these legends, there's so many stories out there about magic and myths and 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 these creatures. And now they're not around anymore. So my my series answers the question, where did what happened to them? And so 
you know, the elves have their own sort of very, very wise old culture, and so do the dwarves, of, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, in the story. And some of them have just died out. So I always look, I always look at their motivation. You know, if I if I'm writing from the elves' perspective, I got to think, okay, what is it about their culture? How do they act? Um, and that's that's kind of where I have where I find their voice and and the decisions that they make. Interesting. How about how do you come up with the names of your characters? Uh, well, I, and that goes into the whole deep world building. So. Um, in in the Val saga, one of the things that, uh, like I said, it takes place here on Earth. So, um, the idea was that the uh, the elves were very influential in certain uh, Middle Eastern cultures, and the dwarves were very um, in instrumental in the in the Scandinavian cultures. So they gave they gave um birth or they they create you know the, the the languages of the middle east and the languages of the of scandinavia came from them so i had to, i had to use that as the root and then i had to look at how those uh, languages changed since in in the story the uh the elves and the dwarves disappear for a while um and so how so how did that language of the Middle East uh, evolve and how did the language of Scandinavia evolve? And then I had to naturally evolve the language of the elves and the dwarves. So that's it's all based on, you know, Proto-European uh, languages and, um, uh, and Old Norse languages. Everything's based on that. Um, so in that sense, it was easy, but it was also you know, you, you, I put myself in that box to stay in that lane, you know? Yeah, yeah. That sounds interesting, man. Thanks. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, moving into number eight, and this one might be a little divisive too. He's an unusual author maybe to appear on a fantasy list, but <laughs> that is The Gunslinger by Stephen King. And one of the quick things about this book, you know, it, it started out with kind of this simple premise, which was the uh, the gunslinger and the dark man. Yeah. And, you know, it kind of blossomed into this sort of medieval fantasy series with a lot of arms and a lot of, you know, story arcs. Um, are you a Stephen King fan at all? I'm I'm a I'm a fan of some of his work, he, he, you know, and, you know, it's interesting that you say it's unusual that he appears on a fantasy list. But he just came out with a brand new fantasy novel. Um, I mean, Die Hard, you know, what's the fantasy. new one? It's called Fairy Tale. It just came out in September. Uh, you know um, what? I don't think I've seen this one yet. I've heard nothing but great things about it. I, you know, so it's not a part of the uh, the Gunslinger series at all. It's a whole new series. I don't even gotcha. know if it's going to be a series. But so you know, I I think uh, King himself is a fan of uh, is a fan of fantasy. Right. Uh, my edit my editor uh, Patrick Labroto, um, he actually is um, was Stephen King's editor there for a while back. Uh, you know, he helped him. Wow. with uh, P pet cemetery and a few other stories so sure uh, it's fun to listen to pat talk about steve and when he talks about steve he's talking about stephen king like it's like i'm supposed to know who this guy is <laughs> so <laughs> well, you're but, gonna be the you know, next he, one brother uh that that's cool i'm go i'm uh, i'm i'm all for it but yeah i, I was a king fan is, of the, i was a fan of stephen king and i was uh i started with his i guess you'd call it more traditional horror yeah. fair which was yeah, salem's so that, lot that and the shining yeah. so and of course i was young then so it was very uh yeah. you know the way he was marketed it was kind of like he was the writer and you had to follow him yes. and I, I was always interested in stories so that's how i got on the stephen king train but maybe we'll take a quick detour back to what might be considered more traditional fantasy and this is one called a wizard of earthsea that's number seven that's by yeah. ursula k Le Guin. no I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I think it's Le Guin, yeah, yeah. I'm embarrassed to say that's one series I have not read and I've heard so much about. So I don't know too much about it. I, I you know, I, I, it's on well, my to well, be she's read. She's a little but... bit, uh, she kind of ties into some of the things that you said earlier. And, you know, by the way, viewers, feel free to chime in if you disagree with what we're saying. We would love to have a lively <laughs> debate, but she's very yeah. much a world builder and very much a, uh, her characters are very distinctive, as I guess what I would say. And when I say distinctive, I mean, Steve, they're downright weird, some of these characters. Wow. Okay. And almost to a level, even her fantasy to me feels a little bit like sci-fi-ish. Mm. And I'm I'm a little bit more familiar with some of her sci-fi stuff. But, you know, I've got a little bit of a sci-fi background myself in my works. But, you know, the thing about her is she's got these characters that 
You know, sometimes you'll read a novel and the characters seem a little bit like they came from something else. And that's especially uh, uh, something noticeable in fantasy novels. But you don't get that from Ursula's book because these really? these characters, yeah, they're just bizarre in some ways. Oh, and I'll let I always recommend anybody that's watching to, you know, please uh, take a look at some of these and, you know, discover yeah. for yourself and see what you think. Maybe you disagree with me. I'm going to have to. I, I mean, uh, people have told me that I need to to read her stuff. So I mean, it's, it's on my to be read list, but that just keeps expanding well yeah and, and i guess one of the nice <laughs> things too about the fantasy genre you do have i wanted to make sure i had some equal representation with a, you know more women writers because i think sure. sometimes just by the virtue of me being male i sometimes gravitate toward <laughs> male writers which it, it certainly isn't uh you know to show a little uh equality i guess sure because you know, there's so many yeah darn good oh, ones you know oh yeah for sure she had to be on here i mean she's so i mean she's so well known in the fantasy i mean you right. know whenever whenever you talk about uh female fantasy writers she's she's one up of the there. titans she, yeah she's yep. right up there well in uh, speaking of great writers i wanted to circle back around to number six that's aragon by christopher paulini which, uh, man, a super interesting guy, this novelist. And what I find to be the most interesting thing about him, and there's several things, but I wanted to focus on, he started this book when he was like 15 years old. I know, isn't that amazing? Yeah, well, and that's very inspiring. That's it, awesome. It really is, right? And it kind of makes you go, like, first, let me ask you, what were you doing when you were 15? <laughs> when I was 15, I don't know. I, I, I guess I was uh, I was in high school. I was it's actually when I first started reading because I it was when I was a kid. I didn't um, I, I was into fantasy and sci fi, but it was more the, like the 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 artwork or the, mm. um, you know, the sure. movies or the TV shows. But to get me to read, I wasn't much of a reader. And then one day I, in ninth grade, I'm sitting there. And I uh, I have to write this book report, and thankfully the teacher said you can write whatever you want. So I'm like, oh gosh, I don't. Or you could read whatever book you want. It just has to be uh, 200 pages or more. And I'm like, 200 pages? Gosh, I've never done that before. <laughs> so you know, so the that's that. So that was when I was 15, a freshman in high school, and and I I'm, the first book I ever really enjoyed reading was the uh, A Spell for Chameleon by. Um, Piers Anthony, the first in the Zan oh. series. Wow! So yeah. good stuff. And here, man. and here, you got Christopher Paolini at fifteen, actually writing of right. A fan Do, doesn't novel. that that's blow amazing. your mind? Yeah, that, that's something that to me. Uh, I'll just make a quick comment about myself. When I was fifteen, I had just gotten a bass guitar for my birthday, oh. and I was sure I was going to be a musician. You see. <laughs> Which and I still love music, as you probably know. But you know, you think of all the twists and turns of somebody's life. Um, to me, I almost I almost can't imagine somebody at 15 saying I'm going to be a novelist. And not only that, it was great and very well received. And, you know, without, you know, spending too much time on this topic, you know, it went on to, you know, uh, be a video game and a series and like, so much uh, expanded just from that one first yeah. book. Yeah, I mean, he he just I mean, he knocked that out of the park and and uh, it's inspiring for me because that's honestly, that's one of the things as a. As an educator myself, I'm a I'm a middle school principal and a um, you know I've been a teacher for as my career. One of the things I want to do is inspire young writers. I want to oh, be wow. able to to um, to share my books with them and but also to to kind of give them the boost that they're looking for to to want to get into writing. So wow, that's great, that, Steve. I didn't know that about you. That's uh thanks for what you do. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'll tell you, because yeah. uh, it's kind of relevant to what you mentioned, is that I had a little bit of an inspiration from a English teacher when I was, well, about that age. I guess I was probably 16 or 17. But it didn't come true for many, many years. But I often think back to what Mr. Sherman said to me in my junior year. He mm -hmm. said, you know, I can picture you taking some of these great ideas. You're going to be a terrific short story writer one day. Wow, that's, and yeah, yeah. It didn't come true till many years later, but, uh, you know, I, I was a short story writer for many years and I never got cool. too much traction know with that. that. And, yeah. <laughs> and it was, of course, that's a different path, right? Like you, sub you submit them to magazines and this kind of things. But, you know, as some of you guys know about three years ago, maybe four years ago, now I started pairing them up with illustrations and then it sort of started to, for, for yeah. me anyway, to take I, off a little bit. 
I enjoy your your comics. I mean, they're they're fabulous. Yeah. Well, I've thanks, been, man. Thanks. My son I, and I, re- I, my son really liked the um the Hunchback one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that was a fun that was one. great. That was a fun one to make. And I know we share a, a common artist. We'll give him a sh- shout out here. That's Our right. boy Erwin Arosa. Yes, yeah. He is the best. And did I understand he's doing some of the design work for your novel, the character? He is. He's or... he's done all the concept art. Uh, oh man, for, great. for for the book. I mean, his his art is featured on the cover. It's featured in. Uh, you know, on, on the website, yeah, he does some fantastic work, and he really brought, uh, took my ideas and and really brought them to life. We're lucky to know a guy like that, aren't we? Yes, very much so. He's a great guy. So, uh, without further ado, let's move on to number five. This is a uh, man; it's so successful, it almost has to be on any list. <laughs> which is number five? Yes, it's Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling, and um. I have to be honest with you. I was first turned on to this by my daughter, um, who, of course, I'd never heard of it. It was already a thing by the time mm-hmm. I'd heard of it. But she said, no, Dad, I think you might like this. And generally, you know, it, I would say it wasn't really framed in a way that would 100 percent appeal to me. But I liked it. And I kind of like J.K. Rowling's writings. And yeah. what did you think of it when it first came out? Well, I didn't. I honestly, same, uh, very similar to what you were saying is that I wasn't really turned on to it. Um, I mean, I, I was like fantasy, but I don't know. I just there was something about uh, Harry Potter that I, you know, I didn't I, I never picked it up. And um, I'm teaching a, a middle school uh, special ed class and. I was trying to find some ways to get a couple of my kids interested in, and he was just talking about Harry Potter. And um, so we started reading Harry Potter in the classroom and and we read the first five books in the whole, in in that year of school, that was, that was pretty much, I turned that into the curriculum of, uh, for English because it was what they were interested in. And, you know, he got the other kids interested. So, yeah, I mean, that, that there's just so many levels uh, and so many interesting things in that, just in that first book alone that just appeal to young readers i mean even reader you know when you look at a book that size and then the amazing thing to me was that kids were reading these thick books you couldn't yeah. get them to read those thick books and, when, and by the way uh churning through them it was a page turner like the kids that i know they were well, like in my family, again, I'll be honest with you, it's, we're kind of a nerd family. And my <laughs> daughter was the type, if you remember back then, they would have what they called a midnight release of these books. Yes. yes. Right. And, and you'd have to go to your local <laughs> place and kind of that's stand right. in a line. And and dress up you, like the characters. Yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, exactly. right. I remember doing that. But she would even, you know, she would have this book read in the first, like over the course of a weekend. And yeah. one thing that I thought Rowling did very well, and I want to make, how do I say this? There's an element of simplicity to it. And I don't mean that in a way that it's not complex because it is, but Mm -hmm. she explains everything in a way that's very accessible and she packs a lot of detail into a very economical package. That's a good way of putting it. I think that's what that's what the appeal is, because, I mean, what other there's no book out there that that appeals to kids like that. I mean, right. Right. Don't read are reading Harry Potter. It, it's insane. It's it's and unbelievable. There's something to be said for a woman that got that many kids to read. You know, I yes, I, I sometimes talk to uh, my readers about how one of the things about reading is that you can't necessarily tell someone to read something or they tend to resist it. I think they have to discover it sure. and to, to sink their hooks into it, as it were. And, oh, and music is the same way. Like if somebody's saying, you got to hear this, you got to hear this, you start <laughs> to go, eh, I don't know, man. But yeah. if you discover it on your own, you kind of right. take ownership of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you mind if I ask how long you've been teaching, Steve? Oh, gosh, this is my 28th year in education. So I, oh, I was well I, right now I was been a principal for the last 12 years. So interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Hey, I yeah. appreciate what you do, man. I just came uh, yesterday from my son's PTA meeting and I told them the same thing, <laughs> uh, particularly in the world we live in today. Education mm-hmm. is more important than ever. And to uh, devote your time to that craft and especially to devote that many years to it. I'm I'm thankful for what you did. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's it's definitely one of those uh, careers that is uh, uh, career paths that you know that there are some days that are it's just so worth it, and some days where it's like, oh my god, why am I doing this? You know? <laughs> why am I doing but, this to myself? I mean, I'll, I'll I'll give you an example. I mean, I'll I will never forget this day as long as I live. I mean, I, it was and it only happened just a few years ago. So, uh, first thing in the morning, I got 
several teachers called out sick. My secretary calls out sick. Um, I, my, I don't have an assistant principal yet because I haven't hired one. And everything is just going nuts. I mean, there's so many things going on and I'm getting stressed out. I'm like, okay, I, I'm ready to, I'm ready to snap. And the sub who was, or the, the para that I had to answer the phone says that, um, comes to me and says, you have a phone call. And I'm like, now you're at, you're telling me I got a phone call now. And she said, yeah, you might want to take it. It's, um, it's one of your students. He's about to go into surgery and he wanted to talk to you. Oh my gosh. And at that minute, it just like every care in the world just totally just fell away. And I picked wow. up this phone and the mom's on the phone. And she says, yeah, they're, they're rolling them down the hall now. And he asked to speak to you. Hmm. And he just wanted this. He just he missed saying good morning yeah. to me because he was out. He was having brain surgery, and I'm like, Oh, oh my gosh, gosh. is know? he okay? And yeah, he's great. Okay. He's doing well now. But it's just, it, it's just incredible to think about. You know that that was a day that that I just, I, you know, almost I wasn't going to throw in the rope, but I was ready to throw in the rope. Sure. And, and and here you just get this, uh, you know, this little hug from God. That is yeah, just like, absolutely, man, wow. you made a difference apparently i don't yeah. <laughs> that's a great you know, story steve yeah it was it was just yeah i'll never forget it well thanks yeah. for sharing that one <laughs> thanks <laughs> so uh moving on to the next element of our list here uh kind of looking forward to talking about this and see what you think of this <laughs> author that's number four american gods neil gaiman ah, neil gaiman is incredible i i but i have not read this series yet i'm i want to it's on my to be read list but i've read his norse gods i've read um Oh gosh, what was the other one? Sandman series with oh, by, yeah. by him. Yeah. 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 But I, I have not yet picked up American Gods. Have you? I, I have. You know, I'm a Neil Gaiman fan, full disclosure yeah. here. So I, I will yes. tell you. Well, and I mentioned in the other show that you could probably make a pretty solid argument <laughs> that Sandman is one of the reasons why I said, hey, maybe I'll try comics instead of wow. short stories. Because, you know, he writes like what's the right phrasing here? Like even in the Sandman, it isn't really set up like a comic necessarily. No, no. Like, like you could say the visuals sell it, but if you took all the visuals out, it's a terrific story and a terrific yes. novel. I, I don't think you even need the visuals for it to still be one of no. Neil Gaiman's right. best works. Yeah. Um, the one, uh, you know, one small critical element I would have about <laughs> Neil Gaiman and American Gods, because because I know everything, I guess I'm so smart. <laughs> but you know, as a British uh, guy. He doesn't always necessarily capture the essence of American characters. Oh, people are probably going to flame me for saying that. <laughs> his, you know, and by the way, please keep in mind, I love all his characters and I, I love his work. He's one of my all time favorites. So don't hear that I'm bashing him <laughs> in some way. But, you know, sometimes when his American characters are even speaking, you kind of go. That sounds like a British <laughs> fella to me. Oh, <laughs> but how does the TV series hold up to the books? Have you watched that at all? The Sandman? No, well, I haven't watched Sandman. No, I'm talking about the American I've seen Gods. the Sandman TV show, but I haven't seen the San the American, the American Gods God. TV okay. show. Gotcha. Uh, the Sandman TV show, I'll, I'll tell you, I've seen the first four or five, I guess, and they kind of did this really loving retelling of mm. uh, it's some of the script is word for word, and even the wow. scenes are. Which well, is, I think he I, was I involved like in it. I think he was involved. That, that's I my mean, understanding. That's my talk understanding. Talk about your talent. I mean, this man, he he. He's involved in the produ in the visual production of his shows. He he does comic books. He does he audio he narrates all his audio books. I mean, yeah, it's just incredible. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. a huge fan, so I guess there's yeah. you know what, what more can you say? That's we could probably make a whole episode just about the old game. I'm gonna have to get uh, yeah. I'm that's that's I'm gonna have to move that one down in my TBR list. Well, you're gonna like this one. I think our next one is number three, and I can't wait to hear what you think about oh. this. This is number three, The Way of Kings, Brandon Sanderson. Oh, you got it right there, Handy. <laughs> I got it right there. Okay, so I, this... I'm going to let you, yeah, if you oh. don't mind, tell us a little bit about why you're a fan. And if you could touch on a little bit, you know, we're Kickstarter creators, you and I. If you could yeah. mention a little bit about that, too, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, for sure. For for me, this is the book that sets the standard for all other fantasy novels. I mean, and that's what really blew my mind. I mean, you talk about the perfect storm of world building, storytelling, prose, and character development. It's right here. Look how thick this thing is. I mean, yeah. it, it's thick, but it is phenomenal. I mean, I, I fell in love with his writing, and he 
he quickly became my favorite author. I, I started with um, Miss Bourne and I just couldn't stop reading all this stuff. And then and then when I got to this one, I this is the the last book that actually kept me up at night that I just did not want to put it down. And I just <laughs> I was up till past one and I one o'clock in the morning and I go to bed. Normally, I go to bed between nine and ten because I get up at four o'clock in the morning to write. But I'm reading this book. It was just I mean, he just has a way of. um of like i said it, it, he he does he does it all well I mean, he does the prose well he does the storytelling well he does the world building well his world building is phenomenal in 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 this book um and uh he just um yeah, he he just I I couldn't I I can't I don't know I could go on forever about him. That's what well, I, well, I'll definitely so, check that one out yeah. on your recommendation. Yeah. And, and oh, again, yeah. viewers, it's if a you series. hear some of these books, like I say, this is our way of telling you, please check some of these out. These yeah. are the ones that we love, and we invite you to sort of discover them. Steve, can you tell us a little bit about? Uh, there's I haven't read this one. I'll look forward to reading it, but I do want to mention I do know about his uh, uh, influential Kickstarter history oh my goodness and how he and you can probably explain it better than i can so i'll give you a second but like he kind of writes these books in secret and then releases them to this huge uh, well, commercial success well that was the funny thing so okay so the reason why it was so successful there i i would say there's two reasons number one is he is one of the most in touch authors with his with his community mm. i mean he does I mean, he is not afraid to talk to a fan he is uh, he just he does so much for his fans. I mean, so so he comes out. So he's built this incredible fan base. And then one one day he puts out this video where he looks haggard and he looks terrible. And he says, and, you know, tomorrow I want you guys to stay tuned because I have this um, I have this announcement I need to make. And, you know, and all his fans are talking the web the, you know the the, the web pages are blowing up oh my gosh something happened you know he's he's sick he's you know right. he's not going to write again he's you know and everybody's panicking and then he gets on the next day releases the video and again he looks haggard worn down and he introduces and he says i have to confess i've been lying to you all and then he just goes into this whole thing and he, you know, he starts saying, I wrote this book and I wrote this book and I wrote this <laughs> all during the pandemic, you know, th right. because one of the, and the reason why he was able to write so many books during the pandemic is not, he's just a writing machine in general, but um, he wasn't touring. So he had more time to write and yeah. that was the big surprise. And so it's no, it's no wonder why he was able to make, 42 million dollars on a kickstarter because he built that fan base and then he just built up the anticipation for this novel for this uh, big announcement yeah. and you know 42 million dollars later he broke the record he broke every kickstarter record it's incredible yeah. well and the thing that is in my and by the way i remember all this and i remember even how everybody <laughs> was speculating about maybe what it was going to be and yeah. it was a lot of fun to be a part of yes but, well and, after and, the fact i mean people were worried at first right at first it was like maybe something was wrong yeah but I, you know yeah. i will say that you touched on something that's really kind of important and it, and it reflects on guys like you and i who were you know sort of at the beginning of the arc of uh making a successful career out of writing and kickstartering which is the most important thing and I think that uh, Mr. Sanderson really illustrated this mm -hmm. is to be in touch with your fan base. For sure. And, you know, I, I say that in this sense because I noticed that there is a lot of pressure, I'll say, for lack of a better word, to produce a certain kind of content or to conform to a certain set of ideals. And I, I noticed that I don't do that necessarily. I do. Mm -hmm. I try to do what I think my fans will like. And I, I think that you're the same way. Would you say you're the same way? Well, I, I'm a people person, that's for sure. I mean, I, I definitely, uh, you know, it's it's the nature of my job, my, my day job as a principal yeah. to be a pe people person. But yeah, I, I just don't know how he does what he does. I mean, he, he's a machine. I mean, he just, he he writes, he does all these conventions, signs book after book after book. I mean, and he's able he's able to do what, what, no other writer has has ever done i mean right. uh, you know because he makes it he makes it a point 
to connect with his community and yeah. you know he'll he'll do things for the for his community you know like one did you hear what he did you know a couple of days after the the kickstarter I, broke i remember the there was something for the returning to tell us about it steve well yeah he just went on and he got his whole team together and he said we're going to go through every uh, publishing kickstarter that that is live during the month of month of march and we're going to we're going to fund it and they just he <laughs> funded I don't I don't know how many but I mean he did these brief little videos and and they just they funded each one and you know and and some of them he he showcased and you know he was like you know there was one that you know that was a tearjerker because it was written for his dad or something like it written you know this guy was writing it for his dad right, and his dad right. had passed away and he's like oh we got to fund that one you know that kind of thing That's awesome um, man that's yeah, really awesome Yeah yeah I'm I'm hoping he funds mine. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll have, or, we, or at least pledges. I'm hoping, you know. Yeah, I uh, hope so too. As we go yeah. uh, forward, because uh, we're getting a little close to the end, I'll make sure at the end here, uh, we're going to tell you a little bit more about Steve's upcoming book and where you can find him and how you can pledge to this exciting new project. Thanks. So as we move forward, uh, number two, I'm a huge fan of this one and it's yes. movie series didn't do too well, which surprised yeah. me, but the writing of it, I like, and, uh, the author, I just love yes. that's number two, the lion, the witch and the wardrobe by CS Lewis. Oh yes. That, that was, that's one of my all time favorites, the whole series, but do you um, remember when did you first, uh, when did you first hear about CS Lewis? Oh Gosh, school, when maybe? I was, well, no, my dad, my dad read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and, and that was the only one he read to, he read to us or told us about, but, because I didn't know that there were other books in the series, like I said, I wasn't mm -hmm. much of a reader, but, um, so he, you know, the other books, again, I think I was a teacher when I finally read all the other books and read them with my students, um, but I just, um, and then when I became a Christian, I, I learned more about who C.S. Lewis was, and, and, Right, you know, and and some of the uh, the symbolism in, in the books, right, which, which is pretty strong in some of his books. Oh and, yes, you know, I think that that's one of the things that could potentially, you know, could potentially, you know, distract readers. But I think he does it perfectly. Oh yeah, and he does. It, it, you might make a pretty solid argument that it is the best allegory uh, you know uh, out of many of the books out there yeah. or at least th that's one man's opinion folks well like some say, people argue they'll tell you it's not an allegory they'll you know they'll go back and forth he never intended but i mean there's definitely a, a lot of symbolism in there like i mean you can one of my favorite lines from from the books is um and i believe if i was either dawn treader or um or prince caspian where lucy and aslan are on the shore and um uh, Lucy's getting ready to go back and, and Aslan tells her that um, in your world, I'm known by another name. It's best that you learn what that is. <laughs> I get chills when I hear that yeah, line. I'm like, good Whoa. stuff, man. Good stuff. That was, and and I, I love that they actually kept it in the movie. That line um, was in, it was in the movie. So I, um, yeah, it's good, really good stuff. That's one of the reasons why I tried to place it kind of high on the list. It's you know, <laughs> it, it's certainly a story I think that can reach everybody. Yes. Oh, it it has. I mean, it it you know, people will, you know, won't even realize the symbolism that's in there, and you know, and right, right. One of the things that Lewis said that really appeals to me as as a writer and a Christian is that he he said, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said something to the effect that, um. What the world needs is not more people writing Christian stories, but more Christians writing good stories. What mm -hmm. I thought was just a great, you know, uh, a great. Um, it's a great line. Uh, it's a great line. And, and it's very telling for me as a Christian, you know, because, you know, my stories, there's there's definitely Christian elements in it, but it's not it's not preachy. It's not it's not going to you know, you're not going to turn to the end and, and be faced with, you know, you have to. You have to, um, you know, you have to convert or anything like that. It's, I mean, but well, and you know, I think that's a that's a smart way to do it, Steve. And like yeah, we were saying, I mean, it's it's a story. Do is get people to discover it, and you yeah, know. I just want, you know, I I want to write a good story, and I want people to enjoy it, and um, you know, and, and interpret things the way they 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 want to, and if they well, want to know more, I'm here. Yeah, that's <laughs> well, we're on the subject of uh, C.S. Lewis, and I won't belabor this because it technically belongs on an, it wasn't quite fantasy that's why i didn't mention it but are you a fan of out of the silent planet which is his kind of sci-fi story or that was like... the the, the sci-fi trilogy the three that he wrote yeah yes. yeah and i wasn't when i was younger because i really didn't understand it i mean that one is more 
overtly uh, Christian from what I uh, what I remember or what I understand because it talks. I think the the premise is that there's no sin on that world uh, on those worlds, right? Correct, correct. And and yeah. the, the the reason why our planet doesn't give off a signal, which can be tr traced, is because our world is bent. <laughs> Which, it, yeah. It's a terrific book. And like I say, ah. you know, you read these when you were young and I, I didn't understand any of the Christian themes. I just thought it was yeah. an awesome story. Yes. And the thing that I particularly like about it, which is also going to tie into number one, I'm a little bit of a language guy. <laughs> yes. And I like the rhythm of language. I love the rhythm of words and the certain cadence with which people speak is appealing to me. And it's it's definitely apparent in uh, C.S. Lewis work. And it's certainly apparent in our number one pick. You probably guessed already what it is. Number one, Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah. I um, mean, what can you say about a, a work that is still thriving today? Yes, one thing. it's transcended generations. I mean, it is It is like they say he's the grandfather of fantasy. I mean, he... You know all the tr all all the tropes that we we talk about in these uh, fantasy books that we write these days are I mean he he did most of them first <laughs> right and it's he does something that's kind of cool which I try to live by today and it's something that uh, that I always apply to writing projects no matter what I'm writing for and it's the element that if the lights are turned off you can still tell who is speaking. Like everybody has a certain way that they talk and it's almost like a, you know, for lack of a better word, when I was young, I would just say, well, they talk kind of funny, you know, like <laughs> the dwarf talks funny and the elf yes. talks funny, but it, in certain ways you could, like I say, if you couldn't see the characters at all, you can tell who's talking. Yes. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and that's, uh, it's called the, the, the character's voice. I mean, every voice needs to be distinct. Um, and that's definitely something that I I made sure of. Um, I agonized over with with a lot of characters. Some of the characters that came really easy for, and others, um, especially like the the dwarves in in my book, I wanted them to have a very specific sort of way of speaking. And I I I, I you know I I analyzed every word to make sure that when it was translated into English, it still had that like you said sort of cadence there. Right and. Um, uh, you know, I know that if you know Tolkien started his whole series was based on just writing in Elven language. You know, right? Just, Isn't that amazing? That was his whole background was in. Yeah. Yeah, he's gonna and there's there's a couple of funny memes about it, but the one is something <laughs> along lines: I'm gonna invent this deep and archaic language in this beautiful and lush world, and then I'm gonna start a war in it, <laughs> which is kind of what he did. I've never seen that. Yeah, he did. Yeah, that's you, you know, cool. for my uh, experience with Tolkien, I was in. 10th grade or maybe 11th grade like most people i was turned on to the hobbit first mm -hmm. and which i think is the correct way to do it kind of tying back to the you know the rowling's works which is you know you, you sort of discover it a little bit and it's charming yeah. and it's this great storyline but you start to go hey well there's all these races of people and creatures and they all kind of interact and right about that time I can remember being in New York City to go and see a ball game. It was at Shea Stadium. We were seeing oh, the Yankees. The Mets. My, my dad took me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe it was the Mets now that you're saying If, that, if it was Shea Stadium, it was definitely the Mets, unless the, the Mets, Mets were yeah. playing Yankees. But. And uh, looking up on a bridge and somebody had spray painted graffiti, it said, Frodo lives. <laughs> and that made That's me want cool. to track down who Frodo was. And oh. that was how I discovered Lord of the Rings, which I started at a young age. And again, that was the same thing for me. You know, you, you dive into it. It's this deep yes. pool and I couldn't put it down out of the you know, it's the course. It's a trilogy of books. Do you have a favorite among the trilogy? Um, I well, the Return of the King um, in the in the in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Um, uh, but I still think The Hobbit is my favorite because it's such a tender you know, story. It's 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 got a little bit more. um you know, it's just about this Hobbit. You know, yeah, it's it got really a lot of is. heart. It's, it's got a lot of heart. Yeah. And I remember when I was, you know, the way I got into it, like I said, I wasn't a reader until I was in, in high school. So I remember Ralph Bakshi's uh, The Lord yeah. of the Rings and The Hobbit. Yeah. And just the the artwork was just in, phenomenal. I, that was one of the things I loved to collect was fantasy artwork. And, and um, that I, I know a lot of people these days, they are, they're not fans of the uh, Ralph Bakshi's Hobbit and Lord of the Rings movies because they're not they're not as faithful to the stories as you know as they would like them to be but that's right. how I fell in love with it and then I, when I was uh, finally old enough and brave enough to finally read it myself uh, you know 
I still loved it. I mean, I thought it was just incredible. I mean, I, I, what I really want to do now, I don't know if you like audio books, but did you hear Andy Circus recorded, recorded the whole thing? I didn't. Uh, that Andy sounds amazing. Andy Circus. <laughs> I know. I've heard nothing but amazing things. So I think that's probably going to be one of the audio books I pick up in the, in the near future. You know, I, I there was even a, uh, this is, if you hadn't mentioned that first, I wouldn't have said anything, but you might like <laughs> this. There is an audio book of Lord of the Rings. It's selected passages read by J.R.R. Tolkien before he passed. And he oh. even reads some of the poems through the wow. books. And like, again, I'm such a nerd yeah. that I, I even listen to that. And, you know, the I would audio love is not hear. very good, admittedly. There's no sound I'm, effects. It's him. You, I mean, that had to be the 50s, right? So you can yeah, imagine I'm what sure. the sound quality is. But it's his voice. And you can really kind of feel the love that he has for the source wow. material. It's really neat. It's That's like a six, cool. It's like a six-disc set. Oh, I'll have to see if it's available on Audible. I wonder if it is. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Not, I definitely I'll recommend it. Dig it. But yeah, out. I'm a Ralph Bakshi fan too. Man, we got a lot of things in common, Steve. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> did you ever see? Uh, not to get too far off the track, but did you ever see his book, his uh, movie Wizards? Wizards? Oh yeah, yeah I knew you were yeah, going to go there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which Another that's kind of his uh, marriage amazing. between sci-fi and fantasy. Yes, yeah, definitely science fantasy. I would say. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's a good blend. And of course, that would have came out. That was pre-Star Wars, wasn't it? I or maybe right around the same time. I think time. it was around right around the same time. I I, I believe it was 78, wasn't it? I, I, it could that, be. I, I don't necessarily yeah. remember the year, but I, yeah. I do remember seeing that when I was young. And um, yeah. that one had a profound influence on me, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love, I mean, I, I had Bakshi. My dad, I believe, had uh, he, my dad was a big fantasy art fan, too. So he used to have in his shop, uh, he had the Frazetta calendar one year and another oh, year sure. he had a Bakshi calendar. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I'll awesome make sure that stuff. we, I'll get some cool artwork up as we're, when we see this on video, we'll have some, <laughs> yeah. some cool reference material. So yeah. Steve, man, this is terrific fun talking to you. And this I, was really, great. I enjoyed really this. looking forward to your book. Can you tell Thanks. us a little bit about, well, first tell us a little bit about the book and the okay. launch date and where we can find you. Okay. So I, uh, I give the overall premise because there's a lot of spoilers that I don't want to give out. So I, right. you know, the, the overall premise of the book is you have these, um, you have, it takes place now, right now in our world, in our time, you know, we're going, people are going around uh, about their normal sort of business. And um, there's all this stuff happening in the background that we're not aware of because um the magic still exists. The magic that you hear about in in all these fantasy stories or or myths and legends. Um, but what happened was, uh, the elves uh, got together. They they formed a council with the other races, uh, the other fantasy races, and they decided, uh, close to two thousand years ago or um, three thousand years ago, that the humans they're just messing this place up. It won't listen to us. We've tried. We've tried to intervene. And we're just gonna we're just gonna disappear. So they hide the they hide behind a veil, which is mm. takes place in our world. And um I get it. Um so they're there, and then you know, three thousand years later, there are things that are happening uh in in the world. And uh these two guys, Jeremy uh is a fourth grade uh teacher in New York City, and uh Masaru is a uh just graduated high school uh in Japan, and they meet uh some people that they can't quite understand and they get brought on this journey um and there's all this really cool stuff that happens that like i said i don't want to give away any spoilers but, yeah don't give away you too know, much yeah exactly yeah but there's um you know if you're into myths and legends and 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 you know mythology and all that stuff it's all there and um you know creating this series that's what it was about it was the marriage of um a sort of a marriage and also a, a, a catharsis of, you know, growing up and believing in magic when I was a kid and then getting older and realizing the magic just isn't there anymore. You know, there, mm -hmm. so um, and that's, that's what I, that's kind of where the book, um, where the, the idea of the book came from. It sounds terrific. I, I can't wait to read it. Awesome. I'm I'm excited. And I'm looking forward to book number four in your series, in the Waterworld series. Thanks. I've already uh, I've already placed my uh, pledge for that and uh, looking Much forward to it. Much appreciated. <laughs> yeah.
Well, yeah. uh, and I'll put the links here at the bottom for those that are so inclined. Please take a follow here for Steve's project. I'm really looking forward to the new novel. And hey, this was a pleasure, man. I had a lot it of fun was. doing it this was one. A lot of fun, yeah, yep. And if you're you you know, if you're uh, looking and you want to talk fantasy, you can reach me at uh, stephenguglitch.com or thevalesaga.com. Uh, and uh, I'd I'd love to to talk more fantasy with anybody who's who's interested. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, Steve, thanks once again, and thanks to our viewers for turning in. If you'd like to, uh, leave your comments below, especially if you disagree with us. We'd love to hear what you think. Yes. And uh, thanks for watching. See you around.